Thank you very much. <clears throat> well, let me just check my phone's on silent. <clears throat> Do you know, actually, I was a... Uh, have I got it? Probably, uh, I was a... Uh, I was leading a meditation once, and it was a big event in London. It was in a night big hotel in Chelsea. And I was leading a meditation, and I got the whole group, and I was saying, so you're now at this... I, I was taking them through the layers of biology. It's a particular type of meditation where you go into... Take your imagination into your cells, to your DNA, your atoms, to the quantum field. <clears throat> and I said... And I was using my phone, the backing tr a backing track from my phone, piping through the Bluetooth speakers. And I'd forgotten to put my phone on airplane mode. And I'm saying, I've got the group, I'm saying, you're at this point in space and time where only your consciousness resides. And then my phone rung. <laughs> but what I had remembered to do was put it on silent, right? Now, what happens, if you forget airplane mode, which means it can't receive any calls, if you at least put it on silent, it just vibrates. So no one heard it ringing, but at that point, the music cuts out. Right? But that isn't too out of the ordinary because you get these meditation tracks that are looping tracks every five minutes the music cuts and starts. It's a loop track. And so that wasn't too out of the ordinary. But you know, these kind of moments when you panic, and that was me, I was standing in front of this audience and I was leading a meditation. My phone's ringing, it's my mum. <laughs> and it was Mother's Day. Right? And she's ringing. And you know, you, know you, you heard of the fight or flight response? Right, and what happens actually is you lose about 65% of the resources from the prefrontal cortex. That's a bit above your eyes. It's a bit that controls your capacity to concentrate and think clearly. And it drains back, they drain to the back of the brain, which is you know, the emotional area, as the amygdala we've heard already, that's all about fight or flight. So that's why under stress, you can't think clearly. You ever notice though, in those moments that you tend to say or do something stupid? <laughs> So in my panic and having lost 65% of the processing power of the front of the brain and I couldn't concentrate, instead of going end call, I swiped it to answer it. <laughs> but I hadn't quite processed exactly what I'd done. But I tried to compose myself because I'm leading this meditation. So for the second time I said, you're at this point in space and time where only your consciousness resides. Then my mum's voice pipes through, hello! <laughs> and I could see people go, ah. <laughs> and you know, the fight or flight, its full name is actually fight, flight, or freeze. Right? You ever noticed in those kind of moments that if you don't fight or flight, you're literally, you do nothing at all. <laughs> and what you do instead is you hope that it stops. So for the third time, I said, took a deep breath, still trying to compose himself, there's no music, and I'm going, you're at this point in space and time where only your consciousness resides. Is there anybody there? <laughs> the timing was spectacular, and I got this surge of focus, end call, and the music came back on. Anyway, at the end of the, the meditation, I said to the group, God, I'm so terribly sorry. You know, it's Mother's Day, that's obviously my mum, she's phoning to say, you know, thanks for the flowers. Half the group were absolutely gutted because it was a group of psychics and mediums. <laughs> and I just ruined it for them. <laughs> it was really funny. It wasn't funny at the time, I have to say, but I, I, I've, I've dealt with the trauma. I've tapped and all that, you know, for a few months now. I'm, kinda, I'm better now. But uh, anyway, so what I, I wanted to talk to you about there's a mind-body connection. So, so I, as, a, as Pete said, yeah, I used to work for a company, a big pharmaceutical company, AstraZeneca. Who's heard of AstraZeneca? Yeah. So I used to build cardiovascular and cancer drugs. I was what you call an organic chemist. Nothing to do with organic food. An organic chemist basically takes a bunch of atoms and sticks them together in different shapes to create drugs. Much the same way as a kid might build a building out of Lego bricks, but an organic chemist, Lego bricks are atoms. So I was working on drugs for heart disease and cancer, but I started to get interested in the mind. Ironically, working in a drugs company, you become fascinated with the mind, and it was because so many people were improving on placebos. I mean, really, really. And it's something, it's well known now as the placebo effect. But what's amazing, I'll bet every single person in this room has experienced a placebo effect, but you just didn't know. So put your hands up if you've ever taken an aspirin or a paracetamol. 
Right, so 139. Oh, sorry, 40. Sorry, I'm only kidding. <laughs> uh, but you know, so everyone in the room, right. Now, I'm not suggesting that the drugs don't work. Of course they work. Absolutely. I mean, as an organic chemist, I used to build them. I know exactly what happens when you take a particular molecule of a particular shape and connect it with a cell of a particular shape. Something actually happens. But the fact you go into a shop and buy it or take it because it's already in your cupboard tells me that on some level you must expect it to work. Now, expecting it to work or believing in it actually makes it more powerful. And that difference is actually in your head. And, and what that difference actually does is cause your brain to manufacture its own for that painkillers, if it's paracetamol or neurofen even. And the amount of natural painkillers that your brain manufactures is proportional to how much you're expecting it to work. If you really believe in something, like a painkiller, for example, then the painkiller will work that well, but your belief in it will manufacture your own natural painkillers. They're called endogenous morphine or endogenous opiates that will ramp it up in proportion to how much you believe, to the level of belief. So belief itself radically alters brain chemistry. You know, if you go into actually any supermarket, you can buy what, paracetamol for what, 15 pence? Or Panadol, what is it, 159, 150 roughly? Now, most people know that paracetamol and Panadol are the exact same thing, except, you know, exceptions of the active fast, the added caffeine stuff and all that. But by law, they have to be the, the paracetamol. But here's the thing. There's an experiment done years ago with aspirin, and you can map the statistics onto the modern-day versions, paracetamol, Panadol. Uh, and, and what you'll find is for most people, Panadol is about 25% better than paracetamol. Similarly, Nurofen is about 25% better than Ibuprofen, even though they're the exact same thing. Any idea why that is? Yep, absolutely. It's 10 times the price. <laughs> now, we've got a wee story in our heads, and correct me if I'm wrong, and it goes something like this. If something's more expensive, it must be better. <laughs> and we've heard that so many times in our lives, We've actually met it in our experience. We've internalized it. What I mean by that is we've all had the experience of spending an extra five pounds to get a better blouse or an extra five tenner or something to get a better haircut. That doesn't apply to me. My mum cuts my hair. But for those of you who pay for your haircuts, you've spent an extra five or ten pounds for a better cut. So we've all had the experience of spending more and you get more value. But because we've heard that and met it in our experience so many times, we've taken it in such a deep level that it's a belief, it's a, it's a root assumption. So when you pay 10 times the money for the same thing for paracetamol, it works better because you have that little belief that says it must be better. And that belief itself actually causes your brain to manufacture natural versions of morphine. And that happens with a, a lot of drugs, a vast majority of drugs for a range of different conditions. The, the, you have the, the, the power of it is always about there, but how much you believe in it ramps it up a bit. And if you really don't believe in it, or if, for example, you don't feel a doctor showed you empathy, perhaps because the doctor's so busy and the, the amount of forms I've got to fill in nowadays, they've got their back to you half the time and they're typing it in and you don't feel listened to and the doctor says, oh, you'll be fine with some Nurofen and you come out and say, I don't really believe that. She didn't or he didn't listen to me. I really don't believe that. And then the actual drug itself is now worse. And the difference between the best it could be and the worst it could be is actually in your head. It's the, that range is to do with what you're thinking because of the way that alters your brain chemistry. A similar thing actually happens with Viagra. Not asking for a show of hands. <laughs> But we know who we are. Sorry, you know who you are. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but one of the ways that Viagra works, over and above the actual chemical, which is called sildenafil, is because it's called Viagra. And this taps into a curious little thing, process in the brain about how the brain stores memories. Now, the brain stores memories. If two things can be joined together in a story or they sound the same, then thinking of one will bring about something about the other. Right? So, Viagra, not by accident, happens to sound like Niagara. Now, think of what Niagara actually symbolizes. It's a force of nature. Right? It's also powerful, it's straight, it's vigorous, it's got a wee curve at the top front. Yeah, I think you get the symbolism there. But because of what that represents, and it sounds like Viagra, then when a person takes Viagra, because it sounds like Niagara, part of the Changes in the biology of the brain associated with the word Viagra, what it means, the word Niagara, the Niagara Falls, what that means to us actually brings about the same biology when we take Viagra. 
So you have sultanafil is that good, and because it's called Viagra, and what that sounding's like, and what the meaning of the Niagara Fall represents to us, it's up there, in more ways than one, I suppose. <laughs> think about it. Do you think it would be as powerful a drug if it was called Flopsy? <laughs> Absolutely not. Because that symbolizes something else entirely. So the difference, again, between the best it can be and the worst it can be is in your own head or in something you're thinking, and whether it's conscious or unconscious. So I've been exploring this subject for lots and lots of years, and the mind is always affecting the body. It is actually impossible for you to go a five-minute period of time without your mind affecting your body. It's impossible to go a minute of time without your mind affecting your body. Every thought you have brings about a biological change in the brain, and most of the time that causes a simultaneous effect inside the body, whether you notice it or not. Uh, but that's a constant process, 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, actually. We've heard that Tubton was talking about meditation. Amazing. Meditation is a mind-body phenomena. If I take my attention away from a million things that I'm thinking I've got to do and the things that I, I should be, the emails I'm supposed to get done today and, and the, got to, what time you've got to pick up the kids, what you need to get for the shopping for tomorrow morning, etc., etc., and you, for a few moments, become mindful of the fact that you're breathing. I mean, that's, in, in one way, that's what mindfulness is. In one way, it is become mindful of the fact that you're breathing or mindful of what it feels like on your forehead or your bum on your seat, but become mindful of the fact that you're breathing. So you're using your mind, you're directing your mind away from a million things to your senses and becoming mindful of the fact that I'm breathing. You know, what that actually does is it brings all the resources to the front of the brain. Brain scans show that if you keep doing that regularly, it actually causes physical changes in the structure of the brain. So that's called the prefrontal cortex, and it actually grows like a muscle if you keep activating it. And the way to keep activating it is to become mindful of the fact that you are breathing, or become mindful of how your body feels. The act of paying attention to something at the exclusion of other things. In other words, brings the resources to the front of the brain, and if you keep doing it, it causes something called neuroplasticity, which is actually the, the changing in the physical structure of the brain caused by a, what you're doing with your mind. So repetition of aware of the sound of my breath causes physical changes to the brain. It actually causes genetic changes. I study at Harvard. I got the last word in meditation. They, they took people who'd never meditated before, taught them 20 minutes a day of going like that, noticing that you're breathing, as well as you can do it for 20 minutes. Uh, five days a week for two months, they sampled blood, took blood samples day one and at the end of the, the eight-week period, and they found that meditation had impacted 1,561 genes. Now, I know that sounds like, what does that mean? 6% of the human genome. Now, bear in mind that 20 years ago, people prescribing meditation as an intervention were getting labeled quacks. And now we have the fact that meditation causes structural changes in the brain and brings about uh, changes impacting 6% of the human genome. And the conclusion of that study, uh, if I, I quote the part of that study, was this is the best evidence we have to date that meditation slows the aging process. I can testify I've been meditating for 91 years. I have to dye my hair great the size just to look my age. Yeah. But, uh, but, but think about it, it's a mind-body phenomenon because it's what you're doing with your mind. You're, t you're directing your mind to the fact that you're breathing. Just like I could direct my mind to something that's causing me stress, something I'm afraid of, for example. It's what you're doing with your mind is always bringing about a change in the body. And a really interesting, one thing I'm very, very interested in is what happens if you bring your mind rather, you know, we, there's been a lot of research into what happens when you, you think of something that causes you stress. And, we, and that cause it produces stress hormones. So uh, cortisol, we've heard about, but adrenaline. These are the classic stress hormones. A, a hormone is just a collection of atoms. Uh, so a stress or a molecule, it's different words for the same thing. Protein as well, they're all variations on the same theme. So we have stress hormones that and I think, is it Tubton or it might have been Pete that said, the brain doesn't know the difference between whether you're faced with a, you know, let's say a saber-toothed tiger or an email that you've got, to get, you've got to get done. You know, whether the threat is real or something like that, said, whether the threat is real or just something that you're anticipating, the effect in the body is exactly the same. Right? So whether you think of something that causes you stress, 
the body is flooded with stress hormones. Now, on the other hand, if you were to think of someone you love, or even just spend a moment remembering a time when someone showed you kindness or compassion, or even a time when you showed someone kindness or compassion or love or affection, anything that you say comes from the heart, you actually flood your brain and your heart and your arteries with what I call molecules of kindness to distinguish them from stress hormones. And they bring about the polar opposite effects. If stress hormones do that, then the molecules of kindness do that, and they literally are polar opposites. As one set go up, the other set goes down. As the other set goes down, the other ones come up. Polar opposites. Now, what the molecules of kindness do is they act, funnily enough, you're coming from the heart, is they act very quickly on the heart. Now, this is even if you're thinking of someone you love, you just close your eyes for a second and you think of someone that you love and think of the reasons why. A time when they did something really sweet for you, a time when they were there for you. Feel gratitude and that feeling, the thought brings about that feeling and it squirts these molecules of kindness into your arteries. Now amazingly what happens is your arteries very quickly go like that. They make that sound as well. No. But one of the molecules of kindness, we've heard that Tubton mentioned it as well, it's called oxytocin. Now, women are more familiar with oxytocin than men. It's a, it's a reproductive hormone. It initiates uterine contractions. It's also why the reason, the biological reason why if you're well over your due date and a consultant might suggest that you have sex, one of the reasons for that is the increase in oxytocin initiates contractions. It, oxytocin also plays a big role in breastfeeding. But... What few people know, and the breakthroughs in science, is that oxytocin is a cardioprotective hormone. What that means is it protects your heart, protects your cardiovascular system. As soon as you feel the feelings associated with love or compassion or kindness, whether you're in a particular environment face-to-face -face with people or whether you're contemplating it in your mind, oxytocin squirts into your arteries and into your brain, incidentally, but, but what I'm interested in is where it, when it gets into your arteries, it finds little parking bays that are specifically ev evolved specifically to be the exact shape of oxytocin. And once it gets into these little land, these parking bays, it causes your arteries then to create a, the second molecule of kindness, which is called nitric oxide. Not nitrous oxide, which is laughing gas, but nitric oxide. And what nitric oxide does is it makes your arteries get wider by softening them. It softens your arteries. At the same time, it hoovers up the cholesterol and it reassesses the optimum balance of the, a, the, L, the LDL, HDL, the, you know, the, the bad and the good cholesterol. It gets the balance just right. Another thing oxytocin does is it hoovers the crap out of your arteries as well. The crap, that's a technical term for the, the substances that, that lead to the, the substances inside the body that are side effects of stress that long-term lead to cardiovascular disease. And they're called free radicals and inflammation. And they, they eventually lead to the plaques that lead to the heart attacks and the stroke. But it's free radicals and inflammation, not so much cholesterol, which is supposedly the bad thing. It's inflammation brings cholesterol with it. Cholesterol is a side product, if you like, of, of the inflammatory process. But so inflammation and free radicals are side effects of mental and emotional stress or side effects of dietary and lifestyle stress. When oxytocin gets into your arteries, it mops them all, it sweeps them all out. Some scientists have taken cells from the arteries and cells from the immune system, put them in test tubes and shook them up to simulate the environment inside the body when we're under stress and found very high levels of free radicals and inflammation. The, the precursors to heart disease and stroke and heart attack. Did the same experiment, but this time put in a few drops of oxytocin. The exact same oxytocin that you produce through being kind or compassionate or the feelings of love or affection or generosity of spirit, whether in a real environment or imaginary. It's the feelings that it produces that, that turn it on. And amazingly, the free radicals and inflammation came way, 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 way down. And from my experience of looking into cardiovascular drugs, not too dissimilar from what you'd be very pleased with if you just, as an organic chemist, built a cardiovascular drug. <coughs> now, at that point of cardiovascular drug testing, you might have spent a quarter of a billion dollars. But yet being kind and compassionate brings about an extraordinary cardioprotective effect. I'm not suggesting we don't take medical advice. Of course we do. 
And we all know about taking exercise and, and good nutrition, but there's a huge wealth of information now showing that being a good person, coming from the heart, actually has but amazing biological consequences. And it explains a study, one of my favorite pieces of research is called Marital Conflict Relations and Coronary Artery Calcification. <laughs> you might be able to work out what that's roughly about. Marital Conflict Relations and Coronary Artery Calcification, or CAC for short. <laughs> it's when the coronary artery moves from having the internal consistency of a lightly poached egg to something resembling plasterboard. And in this study, scientists took 150 married couples to put them in a room one couple at a time and asked them to discuss topics from their marriage. Now, they, they, they might suggest that you talk about, you know, if this study was done today, they might suggest that you talk about the household vi finances, uh, vaccinations, education of the children, health, stuff that you might get some disagreement in. And what they want to see is how you relate to each other. They want to see whether you're coming from the heart or not. And they, they, began, they, they videotaped them for half an hour. They only actually used the last five minutes of tape. You know, think about it. If you're in that study, the first quarter of an hour, you're on your best behavior, aren't you? <laughs> Especially if there's a video camera there. They only used the last five minutes because that's when security most often had to come in. <laughs> uh, so they figured it was a safe bet to use the last five minutes to get a good statistic. But I mean, they began to categorize the couples and how they, how they related to each other. One end of the extreme, you had those broadly speaking, uh, defined as hostile, aggressive, or bullies. The males in that category were bullying. Uh, at the other end, you had kind and compassionate, soft, heart-focused, very tact oh, tactile, soft, floppy, kind of, you know, that kind of nice. So you could say, coming from the heart, completely detached from the heart. And one of the most amazing symmetries I've ever seen in science, what I mean by a symmetry is a behavior here is reflected in something else. You know, it's, it's the same thing. The group over here who had hardened emotionally had hardening of the arteries. The group over here who were kind and compassionate had perfectly healthy arteries. I mean, you took out of the equation diet and lifestyle, the only difference between them was how you related to each other, whether you came from the heart or not. And, the coming, and now we understand that kind of study that when you come from the heart, your body is producing lots of oxytocin and nitric oxide, which is neutralizing much of the effect of the diet and lifestyle. I'm not suggesting, again, just, you know, go out tonight and have a, two steaks, wash it down with a bucket of ice cream and a Mars bar, deep fried, and then just hug everyone. I'm not, you know, I'm not suggesting that. But there is a case for saying there is a very strong cardioprotective effect from being nice from coming from the heart. Very, very strong cardioprotective effect. It's different for each of us depending on our individual environment, but at the end of the day, oxytocin and nitric oxide molecules of kindness are created by how we feel in the same way, also in the opposite way, but the same kind of way that stress hormones are created because of how we feel. In one end, we're feeling stressed and we get stress hormones and the physiological effects of that on the heart, the immune system, etc. Or we're coming from the heart and we get the physiological effects of that on the arteries, on the immune system, on multiple different systems of the body, actually. Kindness actually slows aging at the cellular level, particularly on the skin and in the way our muscles regenerate. That's breakthrough research. So there's a lot about what you're doing with your mind, how it affect, physically affects the body. Some of my favorite research, actually, is was done at Harvard that demonstrated that the brain really can't distinguish it real from imaginary. So this study, scientists at Harvard got a group of volunteers to play five notes on a piano. Simple wee notes, people who weren't piano players, but asked to simply go like that. Plunk, 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 over and over again for two hours. No, no, that's quite tiring. What you really do is you plunk for a minute, you rest for two or three minutes, you plunk for a minute, you rest for two or three minutes, plunk for a minute, rest. But you do that for a set period of two hours. On a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. They had the brain scanned every day and the scientists focused in on a region of the brain connected to the finger muscles and they found that it grew like a muscle by a factor, incidentally, of 30 to 40 times. It's that word I mentioned earlier, and uh, Tupton mentioned it as well, neuroplasticity. It's the physical changes in the brain that result from repetition of something. Now, a separate group of volunteers, instead of playing the notes with their fingers, did it in their heads. 
So for the same two hours and five consecutive days, instead of going plunk, plunk, plunk with their fingers, they went plunk, 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 in their minds. And just to the best of their ability, imagined playing the five notes over and over again for two hours on the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. They also had the brain scanned. And this is the actual brain scans. Top two rows. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, playing the notes. Middle two rows, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, playing the notes. Exactly the same. Versus a control group at the bottom for comparison. This fingerprint region is, re is basically a, a, an enlarged section of a brain scan. And what you're seeing, that fingerprint increasing is neuroplasticity. The region of the brain connected to the finger muscles from playing the notes for two hours and five days is actually growing like a muscle until by the Friday, the fifth day, it's 30 to 40 times bigger than it was on the Monday. And the group who did it in their minds, it's exactly the same. If you count the actual pixels, it's a 97% correlation, well within the margins of error. Conclusion being, meaning the brain really does not make a distinction at all between whether you're doing something or whether you're doing it in your mind. To the brain, doing it and imagining it are the same thing. So just like being in a stressful environment and imagining or remem recalling, remembering or anticipating to the brain is the same thing. Similarly, being in a loving environment, being kind to people and thinking kind things about people is exactly the same to the brain. And the consequences to the body are pretty much exactly the same. In other words, the mind exerts a phenomenal effect on the body. Now, that can be used for a whole manner of things, out with being kind and improving your cardiovascular health. But actually, how about healing the body when it's sick, when it's injured, etc.? And there's a wealth of studies now coming forward. Uh, one of my favorite studies was done at the Lerner Institute for Mechanical Engineering. Volunteers had to go like that with a little finger. Five minutes, sorry, 15 minutes, Monday to Friday for three months. And that's quite tiring again. You actually do it 15 seconds, 20 seconds rest. 15 seconds, 20 seconds rest. But for a period of 15 minutes, Monday to Friday for three months. And they had their strength tested. They had to put their finger in the machine and lift a wee set of weights to see how strong they were. At the end of the study, the average improvement in strength, 53%. It's fair enough. You are exercising. Guess what the other group had to do? Absolutely. Exactly the same in their mind. So instead of going like that, for 15 minutes, Monday to Friday for three months. Hands flat in your mind. <laughs> and just imagining the sensation of moving your finger muscles. Monday to Friday for three months. The average increase in strength was, 30, was 35%. And you hadn't even lifted a finger. <laughs> now someone, a skeptic once commented, once said, ah, it's, it wasn't 53% like those who did that. It also wasn't zero. Here you have a 35% improvement in strength and you literally have not lifted a finger. See if you couldn't be bothered going to the gym. You could lie in your bed on a Saturday morning <laughs> and do all your things. And I know that sounds kind of out there, but this is scientific fact and there's a wealth of research on that kind of stuff. It's not escaped clinical attention. In fact, nowadays there's a raft of studies on people who've had a stroke, even Parkinson's, spinal cord injuries, Serious ones nowadays, uh, and I'll, I'll sum up a, 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 some of the stroke studies. So you've got studies, people have had a stroke, and I'm not meaning just like recently, it could be up to like 15, 14 years ago in one of the studies actually. Everyone gets a six-week course of physiotherapy. Half of them get an extra hour a day, three or four times a week, when they've got to do mental imagery. So they might imagine that a... Uh, they might imagine that they're reaching for a glass of water and put it down. Imagine reaching for it, lifting, putting it back down. Reaching, lifting, putting it back down. Reaching, lifting, putting it back down. Repetition, 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 over and over and over again. Just like the piano study, plump, plump. The, the idea being to cause neuroplasticity, right? over and over and over again. At the end of the six weeks, those who did the visualization or the mental imagery, as they called it, had recovered substantially more movement than those who just did the normal physiotherapy. And the ideal balance was physiotherapy plus visualization. And notice that the important thing there, not visualization instead of physiotherapy, 
but physiotherapy plus visualization. And this is a really key thing I like to get across with the mind-body connection. It doesn't mean that you just shut off from the world and close your eyes and meditate and everything's going to go better. You take the best medical advice you can give, you can get, depending on your situation, but you use your mind as well. So whatever you're doing, add your mind to it because your mind will always amplify what you're doing if you're using your mind in the right way, which at the very least, if you can just even practice mindfulness meditation, even re reducing your stress is a wonderful way of increasing the effectiveness of what you're doing. But if you imagine like the people who had a stroke did, and actually imagine physically moving, then that causes physical changes in the structure of the brain. And one of the things I've been interested in for years now is I've been interviewing and collecting stories and testimonies of hundreds, thousands of people around the world who've used this technique to help them recovery from, recover from injury, illness, disease, and amazingly, they all do the exact same thing in their mind. They take an internal picture of illness and they convert it into wellness in their mind. And everyone's idea of what illness looks like is different, but as long as the end product, as you turn illness into wellness, as long as the end product is wellness, then you're doing it right. For example, the most regularly used visualization with people who are, getting, who are getting chemotherapy for cancer is they imagine the chemo drugs going, little piranha fish nibbling the tumor. But in their mind, what they're seeing is the tumor shrinking down and down and down and down and down until it's gone. Illness becomes wellness. People with arthritis imagine sandpapering the joints and filling the, massaging oil into them. People with heart disease imagine uh, steam cleaning their arteries. People with injuries actually imagine regrowing and massaging the muscles. People with eye problems actually imagine cleaning the lens, strengthening the muscles. But in each case, what people are doing is turning an imaginary idea of illness into an imaginary idea of wellness. I believe it works. The fact that it's a repetitive process, I believe it works because the brain doesn't distinguish real from imaginary. And what you're imagining to be real, as long as you're doing it consistently enough, the key is consistency. As long as you're consistent enough, then and you keep imagining wellness, I think that's how the process uh, actually works. Elite athletes use this all the time, in fact. I mean, just about every elite athlete without exception. I used to be an athletics coach. I, uh, I've got experience in that arena. And every elite athlete without exception spends a heck of a, long t a lot of time every day in their head doing rehearsal. Mental re they call it mental rehearsal. It's the same, f different word to describe the same phenomena, i.e. seeing yourself not at the end, not in the finishing line, but in the process of moving. And as you imagine the process of being the best you can be, then the brain begins to think it's real, and so the signals to the body begin to respond in appropriate ways. So that's how a lot of the elite athletes do what they call the mental component of, of training. So, uh, so that's, uh, there's just one extra wee tip I wanted to leave you with in the last couple of minutes. Uh, a great wee tip for those moments when you have that little fear, pang of what if it doesn't work or what if I can't change my life or what if he or she doesn't love me. And it's, it's what happens in these moments of stress is all the resources go to the fear and anxiety centers at the back of the brain, the amygdala. What you want to do is catch them in mid-flow and project them forwards. One of the simplest things you can do is move your body. Burst into a silly little dance. And as long as you move your body in a kind of crazy, light-hearted way until it causes you to smile, then you can be quite sure if that's a natural smile, a tug on the zygomaticus major muscle, a natural tug, you can be sure you've interrupted the flow backwards and projected it forwards. When I first conceived of victory dancing, the app, an application, sorry, of victory dancing to overcome stress and fear and anxiety, I was doing it all the time. Because I, like you said, I struggled with anxiety, but without anyone knowing for a large part of my life. Uh, but I just didn't tell anyone about it. Again, it's that kind of, us guy, we're supposed to be strong and have all the answers. I struggled a lot in my life with that kind of stuff. So when I first thought of this way of applying victory dances, I was doing it all the time. And I used to walk, I used to live in Windsor. You can tell by the accent, eh? <laughs> now, we li lived there for about eight years. And I used to go to my office every morning about like quarter to seven in the morning. My office, Starbucks. I write all my books in coffee shops. And I'd put my laptop in my rucksack, and I'm walking along the road, and, and actually what I do, a wee victory dance, because I'm feeling like I just boost up, because it's something you can do at any point in the day to make yourself smile. And I'm, I'm walking along the main road, and I'm obviously not going to do that. So the first morning, I thought, hands in my pockets, that's what I'll do. But I had to stop, because I'm walking along the road like that. <laughs> With a great big smile on my face. 
And I wondered why cars were slowing down. I was going, how are you doing? Oh. So I upgraded my victory dance and I would start, you know, holding the straps in my rucksack and just going like that. And when I got a burst of energy, I'd go, yeah, like that. But there was this point, there's halfway into my, to town when I was living, there's a big roundabout and there's two big underpasses. And I'd walked that road for at least a year or two, most mornings, at least three, four times a week. It, about 27 in the morning, I get there. I don't think I'd ever seen anyone in the underpass. So it's a pretty safe bet I could go to town with the dancing. So I remember this one morning, I got to the underpass and I looked around. No one there. That'll do me. And I just went like that. I only have one move, by the way. And I was like that. And then I'm like, you can see it, by the way. And then I'm, I'm doing my moonwalk, my crap moonwalk thing. That isn't even a moonwalk. And then I was doing that and, and spinning around and bopping and doing a silly wee thing I saw in Greece years ago. And I'm side to side and all that. And then I'm jumping up and down. And I got to the end of the second tunnel. And I finished. I went like, Shh. And I looked ahead. And there's a row of builders watching me. <laughs> and I was absolutely mortified. And remember earlier I said, at those moments of fight, flight, or freeze, because you lose 65% of the resources at the front, you tend to do something stupid. You ever notice that? Whatever comes out of your mouth is usually, fairly safe bet it's going to be stupid. So I went like that. Hello? <laughs> but I'd started it, so I had to keep it up. Because it's more embarrassing to stop, because then, you know, then they know you've just made it up. And it reminds me, actually, of one of my favorite comedians, Billy Connolly. Years ago, he was telling something similar about, you start something stupid, but you've got to keep it up. And it was he first, he, he first went on, for the first time, he went on an escalator. It was back in the 70s. I think it was at the Enoch Center in Glasgow, Saturday morning. It's when all the young guys go to the shopping centre because they're off the school and they, you say, wearing your flowery, new flower, this is early 70s, a flowery shirt, flowery jeans, and he says, walking along like that, feeling windswept and interesting. He says, he's catching the eyes of the young ladies and he knows that they're all admiring his new flowery shirt and his great big bell-bottom flowery trousers, and he's like that. And he gets to the, start, the escalator and he goes, a moving staircase. Well, shot at that, never had one of them. Try that out. And he's up the escalator like that, he's halfway up, and he's looking at the girls coming down, he's like that. And he knows that they're checking out his cool new shirt and his flary trousers, and he's like that, feeling really good about himself. He's getting to the top of the escalator, and he notices how the stairs kind of flatten down, and then they go under a wee slit. And he looks at the slit like that, and he looks at his flares on the ground. And he looks at the slit again, and he looks back at his flares. And he starts to have a bit of a panic attack, and he's like, wait a minute, what happened? if my flares go underneath that slit, well, I get, like, sucked in. <laughs> and he starts to panic. But here you're in a total dilemma because you're trying to be really cool for the girls that are checking out your flowery shirt and your flowery jeans. So one half of you is going, ah, how are you doing? The other half so I'm fucking shooting myself. Ah. And you're going, hi, how are you doing? Ah, I'm fucking shooting myself. Ah. And he said, you get to the top and something's got to give. But what happens is, like, ah, ah, is, you go, like that. But here's the lesser of two evils. It'd be very embarrassing to admit that that happened because you were afraid of the escalator. The lesser of two evils is you just pretend that that's how you walk. <laughs> She's now going through the shop center like that. <laughs> but because you start it, you've got to keep it up. <laughs> but what you do is you gradually phase it out, you know. <laughs> and that's kind of what I was doing there because I was kind of still talking to my fingers, my imaginary phone, and I was slightly getting further and further away from the builders, and I was purposely quieting my voice down. And when I got out of earshot, I went, well, thanks very much. And I put my fingers back in my pockets. <laughs> but testimony to the power of victory dancing to catch the flight of the resources going to the back of the brain, projecting them forward, a session of victory dancing, every time I thought about it, burst it as a little dance and it projects them forward again. And that's a really clever way to overwrite little things you're afraid of, stressed of in the moment. Just burst it as a little dance. You might have to do it several times before it takes hold, but you're training the brain to stop going back the way and go forward. Anyway, I'm totally out of time. Hope that's been useful for you.
Thank you.